Welcome, and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 Radio Program. I'm Daniel Davis. Joining us here on the Beyond 50 Radio Program today is somebody who's going to be sharing a fascinating view of a culture and a language that seems to be slowly dissipating from underneath our feet. The book is The Last Navigator, and I guess joining us today has spent more than 30,000 nautical miles as a professional navigator and skipper before setting out to study Micronesian navigation. He is currently host of the Planet Greens Renovation Nation, and he joins us here on the Beyond 50 radio program today to talk about how he spent nearly a year between the years of 1983 and 84 learning from one Mal Pialog, one of the last of the master navigators in Micronesia. I'd like to welcome to the Beyond 50 radio program today our guest, Steve Thomas. Steve, thank you for joining us here on the program today. Well, thanks for inviting me. I appreciate it. Now, this was interesting. First, we, we have the book as well as the DVD that shows the PBS documentary on what you uh, had uh, actually learned here. And I couldn't help but, as I was reading this, uh, the conversation I had around early 2000 with anthropologist Wade Davis. And his book at the time was Light at the Edge of the World. And in here, he was contending that at the rate of 1,200 languages were being lost a year from around the world. What would it be like to be the last person on Earth that knows the language and the ways of your people? And I look at this and you realize, you know, this stuff seems to be, for lack of a better word, almost evaporating faster than we can actually keep up and preserve it. Well, uh, no, that's true. Um so there's a couple of different components. Number one, you've got sort of the straight navigational component. Um, navigation in Micronesia uh, uses stars, waves, and birds. No, uh, in, in its purest form, no, no mechanical means at all, no compass, no sextant, no charts, and so on. And these techniques are learned from childhood, basically from the time you're, you, can, you can walk. You're taken into the canoe house with your father or your grandfather and uh, taught the rising and setting points of stars, taught the star, the, uh, star path navigational routes to, to and from various islands and so on. So there's a lot of stuff that has to be uh, memorized. Um, that is, there's no written language, so you can't write it down, so you've got to remember it. Uh, then there's the practical learning that happens at sea, and again, um, you're taken onto the boat when you're a kid, and you start to learn you know, the ways of, of navigation. So there's, there's all of that. But then the navigators are also a key part in the culture of their islands. Uh, their leaders, their, uh, uh, they are versed in many of the different arts. Often they're, they're house builders and boat builders, and they know the, the fighting arts of playing and they know the, uh, it's a language of uh, conflict resolution, resolution called Itong. So they, they're really, in a lot of ways, the glue to the society. So it's not just a matter of, like, buying, you know, plugging and opening up the navigation app on your iPhone and getting from place to place. Uh, it is embedded in, in a whole culture. And it's hard to remove just the navigation from the rest of the culture because it's, pretty inextricably um, linked in with the whole rest of the culture. So what's happened um, in, you know, while I was on the island, and I started the project in 82, and I was on the island in 83, and then again in 84, and then went back in 87 and 88 and shot the film. And um, I've kept in touch with uh, some of the people out there. And, you know, the slow but inexorable westernization has, uh, continue to pace in the islands, as it has pretty much everywhere in the world. And uh, navigation and the culture that um, it, it, it grew up in and lives in, um, you know, that whole culture has seriously eroded. So uh, it's not just the language and not just the navigation, but the whole culture. Mm-hmm. And, you know, for anybody who's been, spent any time on the ocean, of course, uh, they understand that sea level... Uh, sea levels are rising. Uh, they're rising throughout the world. Um, I'm in Maine here, and, and <clears throat> Mainers deal with sea level rise, ocean acidification, and, um, uh, and temperature uh, rise in the Gulf of Maine. 
and as you do out on the West Coast as well. I spent quite a bit of time in Seattle and that whole area. Um, and, and uh, you know, ultimately, um, you know, the very existence of the islands is threatened because of sea level rise. Um, so, you know, it's a pretty melancholy prospect, to be honest with you. Now, you traveled more than halfway around the world to meet with Mao. Tell us uh, how this series, I guess, of things led to you to go to him. Well, I, after college, uh, I raced out to Hawaii on a racing boat and then sailed the boat back to Seattle, and then I went off to the Mediterranean, became first mate of a 103-foot schooner and a couple other boats. Um, and uh, then I took a 43-foot sloop. Uh, from England to San Francisco, uh, and the idea was to buy the boat inexpensively in England and sell it and make a little bit of money in San Francisco. We didn't actually make any money, but we had a fine ad ad adventure. And then, you know, so I spent quite a bit of time at sea, and uh, then I got the idea to uh, the guy who taught me Western navigation on the way from uh, Hawaii back to San Francisco or Seattle on that first that first trans, transatlantic or trans-Pacific voyage I did uh, was reading a book about traditional micro or traditional Polynesian navigation, and so I got the idea to to try to go to one of these islands and study with one of these guys. And um, so I was living in Boston at the time with with uh, my wife, and she's still my wife <laughs> after all these years. Hard to imagine with all that time I, you were spending at sea. <laughs> um, and I, you know, started making telephone calls to find out who was working in the field and how I would get out there and get permission to go do the research. I ended up working on a, a film that was being done for PBS at the time called The Pathfinders of the Pacific. And it was really through that that film uh, that I got hooked up with Mapi Ilag and focused on Satawal Island. I was looking at a few others, Pulawat and, and a couple other islands as well. But that's really what got me focused on Satawal and, and, and focused on Pialag. And so I, I did a year of preliminary research and got, uh, you know, you have to get permission to go do the research there. I got my research visas, got a grant from the Wenner-Grand Foundation for Anthropological Research, which is pretty unusual for a non, somebody who didn't have a PhD in in anthropology, um, and off I went uh, to, uh, you know, <laughs> off to the Pacific <laughs> to study navigation, not really knowing what I would meet up with at all. It was it was a fairly gutsy move. You know, and it is, too, when you think especially the vast expanse of the Pacific Ocean and what you were about to uh, learn. Uh, I spent time in the United States Navy, so being out to sea was something I understood, and you know, as I was watching the documentary and, of course, reading the book, uh, The Last Navigator, here is, you know, I'm, I'm seeing you guys, and you're on this sailing vessel that doesn't seem very large, actually. <laughs> and I was on a ship that was 592 feet, 79 feet wide, I think, at its widest width. So, you know, it was a fairly good-sized ship. But there were times in the Atlantic in the winter that it got pretty darn scary, where that yeah. ship seemed like a little toy boat in a bathtub, for crying out loud. I mean, yeah. and so, and I'm looking at the hardiness of these guys. I mean, you guys seemingly spent quite a bit of time, you know, without shirts on. <laughs> I'm thinking, you know, how do they do this with all the sun, you know, and then what about storms? And, and you face all of it out there. So it's, Well, these, they're, they're tough. There's a lot of, uh, you know, they, anthropologists speculated about, the ability of human beings to withstand the rigors of long-distance sea voyages uh, when they were trying to figure out how the whole Pacific was populated. And uh, having sailed with these guys, I can tell you they're a lot tougher than we are. Um, one funny incident early on, um, on one of the first uh, outings I did with them, so it's, it's the equatorial Pacific, and you're at about 7 degrees North Latitude on Satawal Island, and it's uh, and it's hot, um, and so you your body sort of gets used to sloughing off heat, and then when it gets cold, and cold is a relative term, uh, you get really cold. So a squall line would come through with driving rain, and the temp temperature would go from you know the high 80s or even mid 90s down to uh, 
the mid 70s and you'd be really cold you know shivering your teeth chattering and I had some foul weather gear with me but I didn't want to appear to be a wimp so I didn't want, I didn't want to pull it out so finally this old man pulls out his foul weather gear and he puts it on and that gave me permission to pull out mine and and and, and put it on but the you know these they're very tough very tough people and um, uh, they can withstand long periods of time in the sun and long periods of cold and um, and long periods of hard work and uh, I just I came away from the whole experience with you know a great deal of admiration for all of these guys and their physical toughness. I know there was uh, one point you described as you were out there that you started getting saltwater blisters and it got painful even to sail. <laughs> I was yeah. thinking, boy, that's tough. <laughs> yeah. Now, I mean, uh, these are, I think, the overwhelming thing to consider. Um, I mean, all of these indigenous societies are extremely fragile. Um, you know, they, their literature is uh, embedded in an oral tradition, and it requires uh, being passed from father or mother to son or daughter down through the ages. Uh, the effects of westernization were very clear, um, even even then, uh, so this is, you know, 82, 83, 80, well, 83, 84, and so on. Um, uh, and um, the, the societies can't exist in this, um, you know, in a, in, a, in a highly saturated Western environment. Um, kids go off to school in, well, they used to be educated on the island. That was the original education scheme was, you know, you learn from your father and your grandfather, how to sail, how to fish, how to build boats, how to build uh, houses, and so on. And then um, under the American administration, which was after the war, kids were sent off to uh, high school in Ulithi, and all the kids, whether they were from Satawal or Woolly Eye, didn't matter where, what island they were from, they were uh, sent off to high school. And then some of them went off to college. Uh, but when they came back, they weren't really... Micronesians anymore. They were they were part Western, so the inevitable Westernization has moved, you know, these societies to to the West, and you know, in, to a certain extent, it's 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 just part of the process of of the world. Uh, you can't expect these you know, people living on an island to be preserved under a bell jar. Um, you know, electricity looks pretty appealing. Western medicine looks pretty appealing. Western navigational systems look pretty appealing because they're much more accurate and involve much less labor. Um, and I was lucky to sort of catch the, you know, my time on the island, which was, like I say, in the 80s, was at the last possible moment at which the the old ways were still practiced, and uh, you know the new ways had not yet uh, come into play. Now, it was interesting because uh, you described Mao Pilog, which is uh, the central character, the person that you were learning uh, about uh, uh, navigation, uh, and you described him as kind of a contrast of one thing and another. And, and, and I remember there was a part in the documentary when you first see him, he sort of has this scowl on his face. <laughs> you know, eventually he seems to lighten up, but what was he like? Um, well... Pialik is so so. Pialik became very well known after the Hokulea expe, expedition, the original Hokulea expedition. The Hawaiians, the Polynesian Voyaging Society in Hawaii, built a double-hauled uh, voyaging canoe, the Hokulea, uh, in the uh, early 70s, and the the intent was to um, celebrate their ancestral navigational arts by sailing from Hawaii back to Tahiti. And the problem was that there were, there were no Hawaiian navigators left who you know, knew these arts. And so uh, they ended up finding Mao Pialik, who was a Micronesian, who was willing to do the voyage. And he went to Hawaii and, and uh, sailed the Hokulea from, you know, from Hawaii to Tahiti. I think that uh, National Geographic did a documentary on it, and I'm sure it's still somewhere. Maybe you can stream it or, or find it someplace online. 
but there's a lot of stuff in geographic in the early 70s about this. So he became um, a very well-known uh, navigator. Um, but at the same time, he came to understand that the collision with the West was inevitable. And, um, I, you know, Pialik was uh, somebody who was, by our terms, completely uneducated. Uh, he uh, had no money or status or, or bearing in the Western world. You know, he's a guy from a small island in remote Micronesia, and yet he was a world citizen. He understood the forces that were going to bear on his little island and his culture that went back, you know, many generations. Uh, and he understood that the attraction of the West to the, the next generation of kids who would become navigators or not would be tremendous. Um, and he actually engaged the media of the West, me included, to help make navigation more attractive. He knew that he told, he said, if you, because we went back and did the film for, for PBS after I did the book, uh, went back and did the film. And at the same, last, my last year on the island, I was still thinking about, uh, you know, I was already thinking about trying to do the film. And he said, if you do a film and it's on TV, then the kids will see it and they'll think that navigation is something good. So he understood the, the power of media. He was very sophisticated in that way. Um, and, you know, why is there a scowl on his face? I think he understood in some essential way that he was, you know, right at the, at the pointy edge of the spear in terms of the future of his culture. Um, and, uh, you know, he, he's a complex guy, um, you know, very loving in some ways and very hard and tough in other ways. You know, and I was thinking about that moment too, as uh, you know, as you look to preserve a culture uh, through its traditions. And I remember uh, Muhammad Ali saying that as he was uh, going into uh, Zaire, and he was saying, you know, a lot of African Americans, especially the younger generations, really don't have any knowledge of themselves. And that's what you can see as this being that element that can become on the borderline of becoming devastating is you then begin to have generations where they get away from that and not knowing how to get back to at least preserve it well enough to have a knowledge of themselves. And so you can see how he was very intelligent in using media to bring this to say, you know, this is this is our gift. This is This is our spirit. You know, this is who we are. And to know that is to know yourself, and that's very important, isn't it? Um, you know, I don't know a lot about Muhammad Ali, except my father was a big boxing fan, and he was a huge admirer of uh, Muhammad Ali. And, um, you know, Muhammad Ali took every pain uh, whenever he could to go out of his way to help somebody. And I remember, um, you know, my father ran into him in an airport someplace late at night somewhere, and he, he walked straight up to him. And, of course, Muhammad had couple of guys, he got one guy on either side who were like his, his body men, and they sort of stopped, and my father took out his hand and, and said, uh, it's, a, it's an honor to meet you, champ, and Muhammad just shook my father's hand and nodded, and so I ran into Muhammad Ali in the airport a couple of years ago, and, you know, he's, he's uh, I guess, suffering from Parkinson's, right? Right. Um, and so he's, he's kind of out of it, but, you know, I asked the guy who was with him, if I could speak with him, he said, yeah, of course, and I told him that story, I think, and I shook his hand, and, and you know, he nodded at me, so the circle was sort of completed. Um, the, you know, at the, at, the end of the, at the end of the day, um, it's still, I, I, think, uh, I think somebody like Mount Pialig or Muhammad Ali, or you know, there are certain human beings who occupy lofty perches in their cultures that can look out and see where their culture is going and have a certain perspective and a certain wisdom. And um, uh, I think Piali had that, and maybe Muhammad Ali had that as well. Um, tough to know.
I was just mainly referring to the fact that he was speaking about the idea that when we begin to lose touch with our culture, then we also lose touch of having a knowledge of ourselves, who we are, you know, sort of that that root family, if you will. Now, now going into the navigation part of it itself, it was really fascinating how well and the elements that Piala uh, understood you do. He could look at clouds. He could tell weather. He could tell conditions. Uh, there were a lot of elements to it. Give our listeners an idea of what his navigation style, if you will, is, what 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 you learned from him. So the navigation system is based on, uh, so you need, first of all, you need a sense of direction. That would be the rising and setting points of, of the stars. We have a compass, so you go north, south, east, west, um, expressed in 360 degrees. Um, They've got uh, the, the North Star, which you can see from seven degrees north. Uh, they've got the, for the southern directions, are described by the rising, the rising point of the Southern Cross, Southern Cross about halfway risen, uh, straight up, halfway set, and fully set. And then east and west are, are demarked by the rising and setting points of uh, Altair. And there are a number of other stars and constellations that mark out uh, the rest of the directions around the compass. So Westerners have called that a star compass or a sidereal compass. So the stars don't actually rise in the same place uh, at the same time every night. They rise four minutes earlier every night. So the, if you're sailing east, so the direction of Altair, rising Altair, you may not be able to point the bow of the boat at Altair, but you can point it at any one of a number of stars that travel the same path. So your basic directions are set out by the, the stars. Um, then uh, they use the waves during the day to maintain the direction of the boat, and that's more art than science. Um, in the trade wind zones, the, tra the trade wind swells are gener generated by winds that blow over a long fetch. Uh, you've got a big, long ocean there, big, wide ocean there, and the winds generate big, long swells, which you're familiar with, being a Navy man, um, and they tend to hold their direction fairly steadily. So they check the uh, direction of the swells at morning and evening against the stars and then uh, judge the angle of the boat uh, to the, the swells to main dire maintain direction during the day. Um, when they're finally approaching an island, um, they use the birds, flight paths of noddies and turns. Noddies and turns roost on an island, and they fly straight out from the island at dawn to fish for the day, and then at dusk they fly straight back to the island. So if there's any doubt about um, where they are uh, before making landfall, they'll drop sail and then wait for the birds to uh, fly straight back to the island or straight from the island at dawn. Um, so it's an, and there's a number of other subtleties to the system as well. So it's not when you say style, it's not really a style of navigation. It's it's a system that's you know taught from father to son to uh, to, to grandson. Um, that is more athletic knowledge, I would say, than than uh, uh, than scientific knowledge. There's certainly science in it, but uh, it's it's more art than science. Um, there's a number of other subtleties as well that uh, had not been recorded uh, by Western observers until I did my research there. One was um, the ability to read currents by looking at what's loosely described or translated as tension in the water. And Piala spent a long time trying to get me to see this on the water, and I finally did. Um, there's a, it, it really is the way the, the surface the surface water appears uh, compared to the underlying swell. It's, it's tough to describe. Um, and he spent a long time trying to get me to understand what this looked like, and finally I, I did. And I actually got fairly decent at, at reading the currents. Um, the uh, distance from the island uh, is demarcated into, um, uh, into rings, uh, or, or stages called etak is the attack of birds. That's the zone uh, that the birds fly out uh, from. Um, 
um, and a number of others as well. So it's it's a quite uh, involved and sophisticated system that takes a long time to master and then um, a lifetime of practice to uh, stay up with. And they don't really, he doesn't use any maps, as I understand. It's all mostly knowledge in, in, the, in the mind. Right. Um, yeah, there are no maps. Uh, they, so they do use a compass now, um, and there's a funny story behind that, which I'll tell you in a second. But the maps are all mental, basically. They're, they're mental constructs. So instead of picturing the, the, uh, the boat moving across the sea, they picture the sea moving under the boat, and all the, the islands and the stars move around them, but the boat remains stationary. So it's, I mean, picture driving in a car, and the car is stationary, and, and the landscape's moving around you. Um, and, and they, of course, know that the boat is moving. But it's easier it's easier to process all this information without any kind of you know, um, I mean westerners on the in the Navy you probably <clears throat> still plotted on charts this was before satellite navigation and everything was all electronic um, um, but they you know they have sort of a mental uh, chart plotter running in their head with the boats in the middle just like it would be on the GPS of your car and the map moving around you so the story about um, the, the adoption of the compass is that when Westerners first started to penetrate into uh, the Caroline Islands, um, it, coincidentally there are 32 points in the star compass, the traditional Micronesian star compass, and there are 32 points in the traditional Mariner's compass. And so the Micronesians just figured that, hey, the, the, the Europeans figured out a mechanical way to plot the the stars on this thing that always shows where north is, so it was it was adopted um, uh, whole cloth into the Micronesian Micronesian navigational system. And they of course knew that there was there were subtle, subtle differences between <clears throat> European magnetic north and uh, true north, the true north of the North Star in the traditional system, and they would make adjustments for that. But it's a, it's an interesting occurrence in which Western technology was subsumed by a, an indigenous um, uh, system. You know, and it was interesting because you had a film crew on a sailboat who was following and, of course, recording what you were doing. And I remember he had, there was a point where he says, "This guy is about as true to his compass, truer than even the the the, the things that we have." <laughs> He's just doing it with a feel, you know, and, of course, the experience that he has. Well, you have to be able to keep a straight course or else you'll really get lost. Um, so in terms of their sailing skills, they're they're right up there. And their boats are fast, too. I think another thing that the captain of that, we chartered a uh, trimaran to do the film, and the captain of the trimaran said, we, we're having a hard time keeping up with them. Of course, I was on the on the uh, on the outriggers sailing canoe, but, and they were the film crew is on the trimaran. But um, uh, the bo the boats move along. Fascinating. Do you plan to uh, try to attempt this on your own, or was that just? Uh, you know, I did this in the early '80s, um, and uh, this was this was a, a lifetime ago, and largely this culture has disappeared now. I still stay in touch with um, one of the, at that time he was in high school, just graduated from high school, who helped me do some some of the translating of the, the uh, some of the navigational lore and the more arcane stuff. And, uh, you know, the, cult, the culture has gone through a lot of changes since then. Um, uh, we did the film in uh, 87 and 88. It was broadcast in 89. And then again in 90, and then I ended up being the host of This Old House on PBS um, from 90 to 2003. Uh, then I did a bunch of stuff for the History Channel, uh, a series called Save Our History, and then I did uh, Renovation Nation on Planet Green. 
and uh, just finished up five years, a five-year project with Habitat for Humanity out of, uh, out of um, Atlanta, Georgia. Their headquarters is in Atlanta doing projects for them. And now I'm working on a couple other uh, PBS projects in development. So um, I, uh, for 18 years, had a camp on an island in Maine, and you can only get there in your own boat. Uh, but it had an outboard motor because you, you know, you know, we it was basically a work boat. Right. So you're you're taking all your stuff across the the water to your island and you know, commuting back and forth by boat. But uh, no, I don't. I don't think uh, I have no plans to go back into the non-instrumental navigation business. <laughs> it's always good once. I remember watching uh, the documentary on the Contiki, and I thought. Oh yeah, but that's a one-shot deal. <laughs> I couldn't imagine wanting to do that more than once. <laughs> well, Contiki is actually what got me fascinated about the Pacific. You know, I grew up in California, um, sailing and surfing, and uh, you know, Contiki fired up everybody's imagination about uh, the origins of the Pacific. Turns out the tour hired all was wrong. They didn't come from South America. They came from island Southeast Asia, and they populated the Pacific in intentional voyages of discovery using probably these same techniques, stars, waves, and birds. Um, and, uh, but it, 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 it really started a whole bunch of people thinking about how did the Pacific get, uh, you know, get populated, this, this huge chunk of the Earth, a third of the Earth. When Captain Cook, uh, Captain Cook picked up a prince on Tahiti, Tupaya, and took him back to London on his, I was either the first or second voyage, I can't remember which one, and Tupaya was able to, first of all, he spoke, uh, to he, he, he was able to communicate with every other uh, island they vid, visited, indicating that there was linguistic um, similarity, uh, but he was also able to navigate using his navigational techniques um, between the islands as well. And that caught Cook's imagination, or caught Cook's attention. So clearly, at that time, the navigational skills were still excellent in the Pacific. Well, I know that anybody picking up the Last Navigator will discover that this is a fascinating story about cultures that many of us probably have never heard of, but will certainly be inspired by to realize, you know, is it good that 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 you know? that industrialization is moving so fast, but as you stated earlier, and, and, and I have even shared this with other people, it just seems inevitable. I mean, it's just going to happen. The question is how these cultures can preserve themselves in any way to keep at least a fair amount of their rooted traditions alive and passing from generation to, to generation. So therefore, they do have a knowledge of themselves. Well, it's, it, recently I did a... A little project with the Island Institute, which is a, a nonprofit here in Maine that um, works to further the sustainability of island and remote coastal communities. And the Hokulea, that same Hokulea that uh, Tialeg first uh, navigated in the early 70s, which has been rebuilt a number of times, is still sailing. The Polynesian Voyage, Voyaging Society is still um, prosecuting its mission of you know, keeping the knowledge of um, Hawaiians as a great seafaring people alive. And uh, the Hokulea was on a worldwide voyage, and so um, with the Island Institute went and did a, a piece which is available online someplace. If you go to the, to the islandinstitute.org, you can probably find, um, find the piece. And um, so obviously there's a whole new crew of people on the Hokulea, and they, when I interviewed them, they knew that you know I I had studied with Ma Pialik. Um, uh, the one of the captains um, knew Pialik and and you know remembered the old days. Um, but what's interesting in Hawaii is there's been a kind of renaissance or a rekindling of interest in Hawaiian culture and ancestry and traditions and seafaring traditions as well as you know, all the other traditions. So um, to a certain extent, um, uh, you know, keeping the stories alive is what inflames or inspires the next generation of 
kids in this case, they were, you know, in their 20s, to get reconnected with their, with their, with their own culture. Um, learning Hawaiian, speaking Hawaiian fluently, um, learning Hawaiian dancing, and, and of course navigational skills as well. So, you know, it's worth working for. I completely agree with you. I know it's fascinating and also lends to people, uh, let's say just like myself, you know, in Western civilization, that when you get a chance to read and immerse yourself into the cultures as much as possible, you know, there's just a wonderful imagination that becomes activated that it seems in some ways technology has sort of blocked that from us. And, <laughs> and it was interesting, especially in the documentary, the scene where the whole community is sitting there watching a movie on TV on a VCR, and I'm thinking, well, how do they pipe the uh, electricity into that? <laughs> well, they have a generator. You know, one, one of the kids went going to college in Saipan, Hawaii, brought, brought a generator and a VCR back. Mm-hmm. And so the generator's, you know, roaring way out, out and back. Mm-hmm. Well, Steve, I want to thank you for taking the time to uh, join us here on the program and share this with our listeners here. Is there a website that people can find out more? Um, you can go to stevethomashome.com. That's got some stuff. Uh, the Last Navigator is still in print. I think you can order it either on the website or Amazon. Um, and uh, I'd go to the Polynesian Voyaging Society. Um, just Google Polynesian Voyaging Society and check out uh, what they're doing. Um, also, uh, you can probably track down the uh, that little piece that I did with uh, the Hokulea in Maine at uh, islandinstitute.org. Well, very good. Steve, thank you so much for joining us here on the Beyond 50 Radio program. What a pleasure. Well, thanks for inviting me. I appreciate it. You bet. Well, right. I thank you, the listeners out there, for tuning in. You can also discover more. Visit us at beyond50radio.com. That is the number 50. We encourage you to sign up for our weekly e-newsletter and stay up to date with what's going on in the world of Beyond 50, as well as upcoming shows. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for tuning in. This is the Beyond 50 Radio Program, and remember, live your day past halfway. 